if I can get serious here for a moment with you. Death. What does death in a video game mean to you as a player? Is it just a minor inconvenience and a constant reminder to get good? Or is it maybe the end of the journey? Is it the signal to uninstall and refund and demand all your money back? Is it a chance to rage and let off emotional steam? Is it a chance to reflect on your past decisions so that you may be better informed on decisions you make in the future? Death in video games takes many forms, many flavors, and comes in all shapes and sizes. Death can be as meaningless as clicking a button and instantly returning to the action. Or it can be as severe as permanently ending your time in the game altogether. Death is an often overlooked mechanic that a lot of developers avoid or cut corners around simply to bring convenience to the player and allow for a bigger focus on other aspects of the game. Oftentimes, death mechanics are akin to sound design in a video game, right? When it's done poorly, it's just outright ignored. Everyone just kind of pretends it's not there or they just hit the mute button. It is often overlooked and bypassed with little thought at all, in fact. Kind of sad. But if it is done right, the impact that it can have on the player, emotionally, mentally, it can forever shape the behaviors and actions that players are encouraged to take within the bounds of the game. Hello, citizens. My name's Soul Sentinel. Today, I wanted to take a philosophical detour down the rabbit hole of death within Star Citizen and consider the future of this monumental mechanic, as well as look to where the developers at CIG may take inspiration from. So maybe we can devise better speculation and better understanding about the future of death in space and what that could mean for all citizens in the verse. Disclaimer, there will be some slight spoilers in this for Elden Ring. I do apologize, but the narrative shares some heavy hitting truths that I really want to discuss and consider that I feel are kind of imperative. One more little disclaimer as well. I'm sure you can probably already tell by the length of this video, this is going to be a dense video. I've collectively spent over 50 hours simply doing the research, the homework, and writing the script for this one. I put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, and hopefully a lot of quality into this video today. So before we begin, I want to ask you to do something. Just pause the video, go get yourself a little snack, and get yourself a refreshing drink, and make sure you sit back and relax as we go in depth on Death of a Spaceman. Lately, with all the drama that's been in the Star Citizen community and with the rather quiet state of the servers in 316, I've found myself playing other games and investing my time in other projects. You may or may not have heard, but uh, the latest Souls game, in fact, released, Elden Ring, and it has exploded in popularity. Hidetaka Miyazaki and George R.R. R. Martin have collabed on the newest Souls title to bring an absolute smash hit to the franchise. And, of course, they've solidified the AAA status of the Souls games. Now, me personally, I've really never been too much of a fan. Not out of animosity or any negativity towards the franchise, but rather just a general lack of interest and in well, always finding myself preoccupied with other titles or games. But there was a lot of hype on this one, and I had recently reread the old 
Death of a Spaceman article, which had me considering a particular topic. Death. The death mechanics and the hardcore nature of the Souls games have always been touted and flaunted by the Souls fan base, and considering that it was a major inspiration for Chris Roberts, I figured I needed to dive into it for myself and see what there was to see. At the time of writing this, I have played for about 30 hours, and I've progressed uh, about halfway through the story. I've had my fair share of struggles with the game already, but I do appreciate how refined and high quality Elden Ring is. I've spent most of my playtime kind of just exploring and fighting random mobs in no particular order. I still have yet to even see all the map. And I have spent a good bit of time playing cooperatively and also PVPing with my friends. I was actually rather shocked when I did experience death in Elden Ring, as it was not what I expected at all. My deaths were highly frequent, and I am nowhere near able to avoid the mechanic outright. <laughs> as I continued to die at a rather constant rate, it turned out to not be nearly as punishing as I was led to believe. This realization quickly led to a major epiphany for me and made me reflect on my own perspective when I consider video game mechanics and the harmony that well-made mechanics intend to bring to a video game. I wanted to do a bit of deep research into the creative mind behind Elden Ring and try to wrap my head around his perspective on the matter at hand. What I found was profound and deeply inspirational. A novel's achievements can elude a careless reader. A film's themes or its plot can be misconstrued by a lazy viewer. Only a video game, however, can punish an audience's faults. If a player missteps a jump, falls to an adversary, or fails to reach the end of a level, a game can deny them access to the rest of the work, halting progress until they pass the test or resign in defeat. Video games are an entertainment medium that is both revolutionary and innovative. Never before has a piece of entertainment been able to hone a level of immersion and emotional connection while also shaping and strengthening the user. The video game designers who morph code and digital art into a constructive and intellectual form of media create masterpieces of entertainment that can fundamentally change a human being from the core. But Miyazaki's work relies on the virtues of failure, patience, and hard-earned precision. You cannot mash the buttons and force your way to triumph. Each foe has heft and intelligence. Their attack patterns must be carefully observed and countered. Your stamina managed. The virtues of failure, patience, and hard-earned precision. Contrary to popular belief, these principles truly make a good game. So many games these days focus on instant gratification and feel-good vibes only, while constantly inundating the player with easy victories to achieve a constant IV drip of dopamine, if you will. Which, of course, in the end, only encourages gluttony and sloth traits that no gamer, or human being for that matter, should ever pursue. I've never been a very skilled player, Miyazaki told me recently via Zoom. He was sitting in his office, a book-lined room in the Shinjuku ward of Tokyo. I die a lot, so in my work, I want to answer the question. If 
death is to be more than a mark of failure, how do I give it meaning? How do I make death enjoyable? Oftentimes in modern video games, we see developers go out of their way to reduce death or the consequences of death within their titles. Instant respawns, infinite lives, minimal consequences tied with the loss of your character's life. Even at a surface level, death is almost immediately viewed as overly painful and serious. So much effort is put into minimizing or avoiding the effects of death that it is often a shock so many video games still incorporate it at all. Miyazaki's work is often invoked by the latter camp, as it suggests that challenge, not escapism or uplift, is the medium's crucial quality. It is an interesting question, Miyazaki told me. We are always looking to improve, but in our game specifically, hardship is what gives meaning to the experience. So it's not something we're willing to abandon at the moment. It's our identity. Hardship is what gives meaning to the experience. Ponder those words seriously for a moment. I have yet to meet a single human in real life who has ever admitted to having it easy, or who has genuinely wished for more oppression in their existence. And while there may in fact be people who do sincerely express these opinions, oftentimes we all generally agree with one another that life is hard. So for a video game developer to not only acknowledge this common trait in life, but to also embrace and harness it, to power themselves and their media up, that is a beautiful form of artistic expression. Still, for every vanquisher of Miyazaki's monsters, there's another who glumly sets down the controller. I do feel apologetic towards anyone who feels there's just too much to overcome in my games, Miyazaki told me. He held his head in his hands and then smiled. I just want as many players as possible to experience the joy that comes from overcoming hardship. Now this goes back to what I was implying earlier. What we can learn and gain from video games is unlike any other piece of entertainment before it. Experience the joy of overcoming hardship. There is so much value and beauty in that perspective. It's truly something that we can all apply to our own real lives and gain so much from. It's creative design perspectives like this that truly separate just another piece of art from the true masterpieces. I personally do not view myself as a very creative or inspirational human being, but if I could convey one message to the world, it would be this. Never give up. Never surrender. Keep fighting. Keep going. In spite of hell, climb to glory. And yet, Elden Ring... Miyazaki's new game offers something of a compromise, a way for people to feel like victory is an attainable feat, he said. All of his hallmarks remain. The dramatic encounters with giant foes, the demanding combat, the insistence that the player improve their own abilities rather than merely power up their on-screen avatar but there are concessions that make the game more approachable. Now, you can summon spectral animals to your side or ride your horse to flee a losing fight. In Miyazaki's previous games, a player was consigned to a handful of given paths, each one blocked by a powerful boss. In Elden Ring, the world is truly open. 
If one path proves too challenging, you can simply pick another. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon to tell you that there are always more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, that might have been a bit morbid, yeah, uh, but we are discussing death here. <laughs> and in video games, giving a player more options, opening up a player's freedom of choice, is always the right answer. There can certainly be an argument for linear progression or making a player progress through a choke point in particular. But shoehorning player actions or forcing them into a particular agenda never feels genuine at all. Real life is about choices. Real life is about planning and preparation. Just like in poker, you can be dealt a pocket ace or a handful of shit. But your actions, your choices, and your planning slash preparations allow you to win, regardless of what the dealer is shuffling your way. But you should not feel that bad, because Miyazaki is right there with you. You'd think that a game's mastermind would be a master at playing the game. But Miyazaki said plainly that I die a lot. He went on to say flat out that I've never been a very skilled player. This similarity between the struggles in game and life eventually led Miyazaki to seek out answers to the questions. If death is to be more than a mark of failure, how do I give it meaning? How do I make death enjoyable? An interesting question, no doubt. But it leads to the next logical question of what is the answer? For Elden Ring's bear, it comes down to the how of our death. When Miyazaki finds himself thinking about it, he says that this is the way I'd want to die in a way that is amusing or interesting or that creates a story I can share. He said, death and rebirth, trying and overcoming. We want that cycle to be enjoyable. In life, death is a horrible thing. In play, it can be something else. Now, there is a critical statement written in between the lines of this quote. That we can gain as much or more than we lose from death. That death can be as rewarding as it is punishing and that a good video game designer will consider the rewards as well as the punishments surrounding death. It's the balance of positive with negative consequences that open up death mechanics to be such a vital part of gameplay. Improper balance and the mechanic can be overbearing or confusing. Not enough gravity given to the mechanic can make it come off as inconvenient or outright foolish. It is so important to weigh the importance of death within a video game and convey that importance in the underlying mechanics. Failure to do so can ruin the experience and easily cause imbalance within the game as a whole. Games designed to be about death often serve a very transparent purpose. Think of Mortician's Tale, Spiritfarer, and what remains of Edith Finch. Whether it's to help us process grief, come to terms with our eventual demise, or even open up a discussion on a concept considered taboo in many cultures. These games are designed to address death in a way that gives meaning or resolution to the player. Now, obviously, there are games that have solely focused on death and have probed into the philosophical depths of such a concept. These games certainly have their place within the stars. But I would argue that balance is still needed. A harmony of life with death, and especially in a video game where death isn't the sole focus, you shouldn't go too overboard with this lone mechanic, as it can easily overshadow many other parts of the game. 
The impetus for the game's narrative, as detailed in the introduction, so no major spoilers, is that thanks to the theft of a special death rune, nobody in the world of Elden Ring can actually die. Players and NPCs alike are doomed to fight over and over, respawning over and over. And your job is to restore order to the world by reinstituting true death. Elden Ring cliff notes for the intro. The ring isn't the one ring. It isn't a thing you wear. The ring itself is made up of laws and runes that can dictate the natural order of life, a golden rule. Someone stole the rune of death, so now no one can die. Your goal is to restore this. Conflict in Elden Ring arises because everyone is stuck in a destructive cycle of perpetual life without the ability to face death. The world becomes a wilderness of conflict and chaos. This world needs death in order to function and thrive. The narrative direction that Elden Ring took with the concept of death is truly a profound and deeply philosophical notion that I personally don't want to delve too deeply into. I think overall, one can look at these quotes and at the gameplay presented by Miyazaki and truly appreciate the work of art that he is painting. Death truly is an integral part of Elden Ring. But whether or not it is rewarding or punishing comes down to the player and their willingness to push through hardship. When game designers master their practice and their perspective into an immersive baptizing experience like Elden Ring, they can weave entertainment in directions never before seen. Clearly now, we can see why Elden Ring is so majorly praised and regarded so highly among gamers. It is so interesting to me that the death mechanics within Elden Ring are hyped to the level that they are. But in fact, they're so much kinder and gentler than other games I've experienced in my time. When it comes to permadeath and death mechanics within video games, immediate images of deleted characters, hours of grinding and working, instantly purged, and many thrown Xbox controllers come to my mind. The meme of the rage quitter or the angry gamer conjure up many colorful and painful images within one's mind. And so often, when we consider death in a video game, this is exactly where our minds wander to. To see the inverse of that within a video game that is touted as hardcore or unforgiving is kind of rather ironic to me. <laughs> Do people truly not understand what permadeath is? Have people truly not experienced punishing death within a video game before? To gain a better appreciation of death, let us look at another example of a video game where death is prevalent and very punishing. Escape from Tarkov. From the masters of Cheeky Breaky themselves, Escape from Tarkov is a hardcore and realistic online first-person action RPG slash simulator with an MMO features and a story-driven walkthrough. With each passing day, the situation in the Norvinsk region grows more and more complicated. Incessant warfare in Tarkov has sparked massive panic. The local population has fled the city but those who stayed are looking to improve their fortunes at the expense of others. Having accepted the new reality, savage Tarkov locals, scavs, 
flocked into well-armed gangs and started the redivision of the city. Nowadays, Tarkov is separated by unseen borders, controlled by different groups. Gain greedy gunmen would go to any length to have their way, including the murder of civilians and direct confrontation with the two private military companies. The player will have to experience living in the skin of one of the mercenaries who survived the initial stage of the Tarkov conflict. After choosing one of the sides, Yusek or Bear, the player's character starts to make his way out of the city. Tarkov is sealed off by UN and Russian military. Supply chains are cut. Communication with operational command is lost. And in these conditions, everyone has to make his own choices of what to do and how to get out of the chaos-ridden metropolis. Battlestate Games has created what I would deem as one hell of a shooter. <laughs> no Call of Duty bunny hopping, no battlefield plane diving, no Fortnite base building, no shenanigans, no bullshit. Tarkov is a masterpiece of hardcore shooter simulation, punishing and ever prevalent survival mechanics, coupled with stylized RPG-ish elements and a smooth blend of looter-shooter, smash-and-grab, hit-and-run, hide-and-wait, and come out on top play styles that truly make Escape from Tarkov a beautiful masterpiece of hardcore PvP mixed with sophisticated and highly evolved in-game mechanics. For instance, look at these health charts. The medical gameplay alone is diverse and highly interactive. While not being overbearing or so complicated that you feel the need to study at Tarkov University for three years. Hunger and thirst mechanics are also in the game, having varied effects on your character and also being an ever-present reminder to always prepare and plan ahead in the game. The beauty of Tarkov's health systems and hunger systems is that they synchronize well with each other and impact each other in a harmonious manner. But the real focus for us is death. And death within Escape from Tarkov is done in a simple manner, but with many underlying consequences and mechanics tied into it. To fully understand death within Tarkov, you have to understand the premise of how the game is played. As it stands currently, your PMC in Tarkov is effectively immortal. You start playing the game in the menus, maintaining your stash, buying and selling with vendors, checking the flea market, and planning out missions and quests. Once you've decided to enter the game, you pick a map, queue up with your buddies, and load into a single raid. Each raid is like a timed instance of the chosen map. You're spawned at a semi-random location, given semi-random extract locations, and a time limit. From there, where you go and what you do within the raid is entirely up to you. Looting, raiding, questing, exploring, getting into firefights. These are the main attractions of this intense experience. But no matter what you choose to do within Tarkov, each and every raid allows the chance of death to happen to you. Once you die, you're loaded out of the raid and back into the menus. You are greeted with the aggressor who slayed you. A health menu displaying all the damage you incurred. And from there, dropped back into the main menu where you can go back to your stash and vendors, stock up on new supplies, and plan for the next raid. When you die in raid, everything that was on your character is lost. Your character retains any damage and injuries you acquired, and you are forced to recover and resupply in order to advance on. Now, there is item insurance within the game, 
and you have alternative characters, known as scavs, that you can employ to go into raid and acquire new gear and loot for you. Your main character never truly dies though, and death in Tarkov usually only amounts to a minor setback that you can quickly recover from if you have prepared and have the proper supplies stocked up. The death mechanics of Tarkov are a form of instant hard punishment that are progressively minimized and eventually effectively reduced to nothing as your PMC advances and acquires more riches in the game. The classic trope of escape from Tarkov players is that it's a PvP headhunter dude bros paradise where chaos, destruction, and toxicity reign supreme. <laughs> but stereotypes aside, Tarkov is a highly sophisticated and deeply immersive experience that showcases the value of a life and the pain of death in an elegantly punishing manner. In a lot of ways, one might argue that Elden Ring and Escape from Tarkov show kind of a duality of styles and death mechanics. One is generally accepting and inviting towards its own death mechanics, whereas the other immediately punishes and discourages you from interacting with the mechanics if that could even be helped. <laughs> One slowly lets you wade in the shallow end of the pool, but eventually builds up more and more frustration and mental anxiety with the player as they are essentially encouraged to bash their heads against a stone wall. While the other immediately slams you with respite and a stinging sense of loss but slowly that loss is mitigated and reduced as you naturally progress in your character's evolution. Both of these games feature diehard fanboy communities, both valiantly raising their banners of extreme hardcore, not for the lighthearted. Both games invest heavily into their death mechanics and beautifully interweave medical looting, and progression within them as well. Both games also manage to mitigate the annoyance or the perceived inconvenience of death with immediately re-engaging the player in other gameplay options and providing alternative routes and choices. Taking a large overview of these two games and appreciating these death mechanics has shown me that Death is never truly a simple concept. Death mechanics can play an integral part in video game design, and they need to be considered heavily when designing a game because the implications of those mechanics and the potential for fun that can be harnessed from said mechanics are powerful tools within a developer's tool belt. So now, let us venture into space and consider the death of a spaceman. First off, to set us in the right mindset, I would like to share a few quotes from a short story titled Death of a Spaceman by Walter M. Miller Jr. The manner in which a man has lived is often the key to the way he will die. Take old man Donegal, for example. Most of his adult life was spent in digging a hole through space to learn what was on the other side. Would he go out the same way? Let me immediately admit up front that I have not read this story in its entirety. But while I was doing research for this video, I stumbled upon this excerpt from the book, and I found it rather intriguing. Having already spent many, many hours battling with Chris Roberts' vision of Death of a Spaceman, I found the parallels between this work of fiction and the fiction that my character within the verse deals with to have interesting comparisons. To the interns and nurses who, while they insisted that he was going to get well, didn't mind joking with him about it, 
Martha can bear my death, he thought. Can bear pre-knowledge of it. But she couldn't bear thinking that he might take it calmly. If he accepted death gracefully, it would be like deliberately leaving her. And old Donegal had decided to help her believe whatever would be comforting to her in such a troublesome moment. When will they let me out of this bed again? He complained. Be patient, Donnie, she sighed. It won't be long. You'll be up and around before you know it. Back on the moon run, maybe? He offered. Listen, Martha, I've been planet bound too long. I'm not too old for the moon run, am I? 63 is not so old. That had been carrying things too far. She knew he was hoaxing and dabbed at her eyes again. The dead must humor the mourners, he thought, and the sick must comfort the visitors. It was always so. Star Citizen is not simply another video game. Star Citizen is a special event. It is a once in a lifetime performance that is actively being developed and choreographed right now. Chris Roberts is creating a universe and a dynamic vision of what a video game could truly be. The game requires many innovative and revolutionary design mechanics, all flowing seamlessly together in a way that is pushing software design and the capabilities of modern computer hardware to their absolute breaking limits. Calling it the bleeding edge wouldn't even do the project justice when considering the amount of struggle, frustration, passion and creativity that have already been poured out over this project people often joke that star citizen has been in active development for over 10 years and that it is not only the longest developed game ever but that also it will perpetually always be in development and will never be finished semantics aside <laughs> this project is still in its childhood in many ways and already, millions have in fact poured their hearts, their souls, and their entire wallets into the project. Star Citizen is simply trying to be the best damn space simulation ever. But with that proclamation comes a lot of high standards and steep mountains to climb. Gaming has already come so far in the 50 plus years that it has relevantly been around for. And many classic masterpieces of gaming have set the bar as high as far as what gamers can expect from a good video game. Star Citizen aims for many sophisticated and highly detailed game mechanics and game loops tied together in a massive 100 plus solar system universe that's bound together with dynamic driven AI running the economy and fueling player stories that will one day push the overall story of Star Citizen into new realms. Already as it stands, Star Citizen is a very hard game to master. Many parts of the game go into days worth of explanation and simply hopping into the game for the first time can be overwhelming and intimidating but before we get too far into the weeds let us refocus ourselves on death death within star citizen is a serious talking point and a major part of the game's design from the ground up at the beginning of the project, Chris Roberts, the director and figurehead of the project, laid out some ground rules on how he envisioned Star Citizen would be and how he saw the underlying mechanics at work. He wrote a particular article centered on death. And we, here and now, are going to dive headfirst into death of a spaceman. 
My goal with Star Citizen is to build a universe that I want to play in day after day. One that fully immerses me in the environment and the stories that happen around me. In Star Citizen's persistent universe, I want events to happen, governments to fall, wars fought, and players becoming legends. I want to see a galactopedia that grows from week to week, reflecting not just the ongoing content Cloud Imperium plans to continually generate, but also the great deeds achieved by players. To achieve this sense of living history, there needs to be a universe where time progresses, characters die, and new ones come to the front. Beyond this, I want people to have a sense of accomplishment when they complete a really difficult trading run, or kill an especially infamous pirate. I hate the current game trend in single-player games where the game auto-saves every two seconds, and if you die, you just start a few steps earlier. This makes you a lazy and sloppy player. I bullied my way through games like Mass Effect or Gears of War, running in guns blazing, knowing that if I died, I would always just respawn a few steps earlier. In Wing Commander or Privateer, you had to complete the mission to move on. There were no mid-mission saves. This created a sense of anxiety towards the end of the mission. If you were badly damaged, your, your shields were low. But if you managed to limp home successfully, you felt a sense of accomplishment. Without the risk of losing something you've worked hard towards, the sense of achievement is cheap. Already, we can see that Chris Roberts and Hidetaka Miyazaki share similar perspectives on life and death within video games. They both hold a value on life that simply isn't expressed or felt within most of the video game industry. The last single player game that I played that gave me an extreme sense of accomplishment in beating it was Demon's Souls. How they handled death and reincarnation of your ghost slash body was consistent with their world and fiction and because I couldn't save mid-level, clearing a level, especially after a difficult boss fight, was immensely satisfying. It was also one of the most frustrating games I've played. I think Demon Souls was too much on the punishing end of the difficulty spectrum, but it really did remind me of the value of having something to lose when playing. You can't have light with dark, and you can't have reward without risk. In Squadron 42, this is pretty easy to achieve. You need to complete the mission to move forward, and you can't save while in space. You die, you just go back to the previous save point, normally before you launched on the mission. The tricky part is really how failure is handled in the persistent universe of Star Citizen, as you can't just set back the game to an earlier point. The simple solution is that when your ship is destroyed, you manage to eject and drift in space where you are picked up and return to the last planet or landing location to claim your new ship and any cargo and upgrades you had. Unless you had bought an additional assurance. And then head back out into space again. This is the mechanic EVE Online uses, with the extra wrinkle that if another player blows up your escape pod, a stored clone of your character is activated, respawning your character and effectively making him slash her immortal. In EVE, death is allowed for in the fiction and is balanced by the cloning mechanism, which allows for loss of property, but not your character's skills, as unlike Star Citizen, your character in EVE has RPG skills that you learn. The death mechanic in EVE is clever and well woven into their fiction. But I'm not interested in making EVE 2.0 with cockpits. No EVE 2.0 with cockpits? Hmm. One of my goals with Star Citizen is to make it feel very visceral and real. I want to feel the effects of physical damage on my character, 
loss of limb or other mishaps that can happen in the dangers of space. If my character has been through several wars, I want to see the scars on him slash her. Perhaps a cybernetic arm because one was lost in a firefight or the wrong side of a dogfight. I want to be able to walk up to another player in a bar and see that he or she is a grizzled veteran with the battle scars to prove it. This is the kind of detail, texture, and immersion that I want to achieve within Star Citizen. I also feel that if everyone can be cloned easily, it fundamentally changes the structure of the universe. You now have a universe of immortal gods that can't be killed. Death is just a financial and time inconvenience that has no further consequence. The life and death cycle of humanity is what has brought us our history, our need to make a mark in our time, to push forward. If I want a living, breathing universe that has a lot of the dynamics of a real world and is inspired by the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, immortality for all is problematic. The flip side is that while permadeath is realistic, it is not always a lot of fun. If the first time you're on the wrong side of a dogfight, you lose everything and then you have to start again. I want Star Citizen to be immersive and fun. The death mechanics that I have in mind keep a feeling of mortality and history without making it frustrating or killing, pun intended, the fun. Absolutely powerful stuff in this one. Chris's vision of death and its impact within the game are core fundamentals within Star Citizen. And while it may be hard for the average citizen to see, especially when we don't have half of the intended mechanics within the game, we are still actively taking part and helping shape the verse in ways that we can never truly understand or appreciate. But it is a story that is being written out day by day. And far into the future, video game scholars and video game historians will look back on these days that we live in presently and acknowledge that what we were doing and what we were helping shape was a dramatic shift within the entire video game industry. The life and death of a space band. The character creation screen will be done in fiction. You'll start the game in first person view looking at two bathroom doors, one with a male sign and one with a female sign. Which door you walk through will determine what sex you are when you walk into the washroom. Walking up to the mirror, you'll see your reflection. Wiping the condensation off of the mirror with your hand, or some similar mechanic, will change slash reveal your facial appearance. When you're happy with how you look, you will exit and return to the UEE recruitment office and officer. You'll fill in your name on the Moby Glass form, and also specify your beneficiary in case of death. This could be a family member, a son, daughter, uncle, aunt, or someone entirely new, although not another player character. The UEE Navy has an opt-out option right up until you move on to advanced training, where you would start Squadron 42. So if you just want to jump into Star Citizen, you can opt out right away. If you want some basic pilot training, you could avail yourself of basic and then buy your way out. In this case, the player would just owe a small debt to the UEE that he slash she has to pay within a year of game time or become a debtor. Debtors are denied landing rights on UEE controlled planets and don't receive any UEE protection until they've paid their debt. A player enters the persistent universe of Star Citizen either after completing the Squadron 42 campaign, which doesn't need to be successful, or by opting out before advanced training and going straight into the private sector. Most players should have some kind of basic insurance, whether it's lifetime whole insurance for everyone that has backed so far, 
or a limited duration insurance that will come with later ship packages. A player will even be able to take out a small loan to help finance his slash her exploits with the same penalties for non-payment described above. You will be able to run training simulations in the simulator module in your hangar. Think of this like an arcade game in the pilot's ready room in the original Wing Commander. To practice your combat skills with no penalty, but of course there is no financial reward here either. When you venture out into space proper, you do put your character at risk. But it will be a long-term one, not an immediate one. I see each character you play having the ability to die multiple times before the character is finally put to rest. Think of this like lives in an old school arcade game. Science in the future is far more advanced than today. Medicine has the ability to bring people back from what would be considered dead in today's world. If you are an active player within Star Citizen today, you are already seeing some divergences from Death of a Spaceman and today's active development. And this is a point of major contention within the Star Citizen community at large. Many older backers arguing that CIG is already pulled too far away from Chris's original vision. While many other backers argue, we need to avoid the old visions and instead steer in new directions. Now, I'm not here today to stir up those conversations, so we're going to leave it at that. And while I will acknowledge that we already see CIG pulling away from many of the original pitches and ideas that helped shape Star Citizen, I will also admit that Chris is still firmly at the helm of this ship, steering us and guiding us into the future. So we need not fret. If you lose a dogfight and your ship is going to blow, you have a few seconds to eject. If you manage to eject safely and someone doesn't blast your ejected avatar, you won't even have used a life. You'll end up back at the last planet you docked on with a new ship courtesy of system-wide insurance. You'll have lost your cargo and any upgrades, unless you manage to insure those that were destroyed in a system with a risk level at or below insurance rating. If you don't manage to eject in time, or someone blasts your ejected character, which carries a harsh penalty if you do this in civilized space, your badly charred and almost dead avatar is recovered, and you wake up in a med bay. This is also true if you are killed in a boarding action, and your teammates can't or don't recover you. If this happens, it is assumed that your dead body was evacuated into space and then recovered. Every death creates wear and tear on your body. Depending on where you were hit and how you died, your character may require new body parts, which could either be cybernetic or organic. Eventually, after too many deaths, your character's body will just give out, and instead of waking up in a med bay, you'll be attending the funeral of your fallen character from the eyes of the beneficiary you specified when originally creating your character. If your old character has done something noteworthy, akin to as an in-game achievement, his headstone might read, Here lies Chris, discoverer of the Orion 2 jump point, slayer of the dread pirate Roberts, and a citizen of the First Order. There will also be opportunities to regain some lives or do a reset. Some of this could be through in-game missions, or it could just involve paying a lot of money to a specialist on a remote med planet that is doing stem cell research. Because of how Star Citizen works, the death of your character is not as catastrophic as it would be in a traditional RPG. If you want to think about it in terms of RPG conventions, the character that you are leveling up and customizing is really your spaceship. Your avatar is really just a visual representation of your in-game character. And because Star Citizen is skill-based, the loss of your character is more a cosmetic and textural outcome, especially as almost all the assets you've worked hard to accumulate pass on to the beneficiary that you specified when creating your original character. Reputation and faction alliances pass on to your new character, 
but slightly diminished. If your original character was a pirate, then the new one will also be aligned with pirates, but not as much and will still be on the UEE watch list. No slate will be wiped clean, but if you want to change your allegiances, this would be the start. This matches life, where the son of a criminal has to deal with the bias of people think he's going to be just like his father, or a son of a cop is assumed to be on the side of law and order. What I like about this system is that it creates a sense of morality and history. No one's character will die right away. It will take some time to get to that point. But players will feel a sense of risk and so will think twice before needlessly risking their lives, as they don't want to burn through their lives. You'll also be able to see visually how battle-scarred someone is. Perhaps having an eye patch or a cybernetic arm could be a badge of pride that you've been in war and survived. When a character finally does shuffle off the mortal coil, the player hasn't lost what he has really put into the game, time to build up his ships, his equipment, and other assets, these pass on to the next of kin slash the beneficiary, and there is a successor to carry on the family legacy or to avenge the deceased character. My name is Indigo Montoyo. You killed my father. Prepare to die! This, this will hopefully create a competition between players to see how much they can achieve in the lifespan of their current characters. The ones that achieve greatness via killing a Star Citizen unique NPC or taking part in a unique event, like discovering a new jump pointer system, are recorded in the Galactopedia and become part of the universe lore and history. With the new regeneration and medical mechanics recently implemented into Star Citizen through patch 3.15 and beyond, we're already seeing the beginning of Death of a Spaceman come into existence. There is still a lot of work for CIG to do, and already things seem far different from the way Chris originally pitched them. But I do personally hope that Chris will ultimately manage to retain the core tenets of Death of a Spaceman, and will make this verse feel harsh and realistic, while also balancing that harsh reality with fun and relevance. Now, I ask that you pay special attention to this final part here, because this is the most vital. This doesn't just apply to a player character. For me, it's vital that there are non-player characters, NPCs, that are both unique and can be killed. In a single-player game, no one minds that many other players have completed the same quest and killed the very same boss monster, because the world only revolves around you. But if you take the same quest in an MMO, which is meant to be a shared, persistent universe, knowing that the next party will kill the very same boss in the very same spot, kind of breaks the suspension of disbelief. Most MMOs just accept this as the price you pay for having many thousands of players all expecting to be the hero. Not Star Citizen. Major NPCs will be unique. And if they're in a place where they can be killed, they will be killed only once. Think of it as a very hard to win achievement that one player or a group of players in the game will ever achieve. If you manage to kill the Dread Pirate Roberts, that will be part of your legend. Similar to discovering a new jump point or star system. Upon the death of a boss NPC, we won't respawn him or her, but there will be someone that steps in to fill the void. So the same area of space may now be terrorized by the Black Skull. Major NPC bosses will be a unique scalp for a player good enough to beat them. But almost all bosses will have someone waiting in the wings. While people may feel my proposed death mechanics may hamper their role playing of a character they have created an elaborate personal backstory for, I would counter that with it'll actually enhance it. There is no reason not to have the same backstory. But now, it's the story of your present character and his slash her descendants. How many famous people are made and driven by the accomplishments of their parents? Trust me. I realize this game is not going to fulfill everyone's personal vision of what they think it will be. That would be impossible. 
there will be some things in Star Citizen's game design that will take people out of their comfort zone. That's a good thing. You backed me to make the game in my head, and that's what I'm going to do. I do listen, and when I think something makes sense, I fold it into my thinking, as long as it is compatible with the vision that I'm trying to achieve. But this won't happen in all cases. So please, keep an open mind, and wait until you have a chance to play Star Citizen. And even then, you should know that we will balance and tweak. That's the whole point of having such a great community so early for your feedback and ideas. And if something truly is broken for a large part of the player population, we will fix it. We are an online game and frequent updates and tweaks are a core part of the Star Citizen vision. I think this is the part of Death of a Spaceman that a lot of backers just aren't aware of. Or they often forget when they're arguing on Spectrum and shitposting on Reddit. <laughs> we are all here to back Chris Roberts and his vision of Star Citizen. We are not here to play the website. We are not here to gamify buying spaceship JPEGs. We are not here to boycott poor sales decisions by CIG. We are here to play Star Citizen. It's not Soul Sentinel Star Citizen. It's not Montoya's Star Citizen. It's Chris Roberts's Star Citizen. And even though CIG may take us down some unknown routes or develop things in a manner that doesn't seem accurate to what we were sold on, Chris Roberts is still alive and He's in charge of how this amazing game shapes into existence. And ultimately, he alone decides how each and every citizen lives and dies. The death mechanics of Star Citizen presently are a simplified version of what the ultimate goal that CIG hopes to achieve. In today's current version of the verse, life and death are liberally tossed around by bugs, glitches, aimbot AI, and toxic griefing PVPers. Avenger 1, you bad, bad man. And the deadliest danger of all the dangers in the verse. Carts and trolleys. I want to give a quick shout out uh, and credit to you slash Scarliga on uh, Reddit for posting that wonderful video of trolley action. I did shamelessly steal that video clip and I've posted the original Reddit thread with the rest of the citations for this video down in the description below. Life and death in Star Citizen is a funny thing that many players battle with and argue about every day while this project continues to develop and evolve. But what about the future of this mechanic? Can we even begin to accurately speculate about the future of this vital mechanic within the verse? The advancements in loot generation and implementation of selling are two key aspects of any MMO, and their arrival in Star Citizen heralds a continuing push to reward players for venturing out into that dangerous unknown to seek their fortunes. And because the unknown can be so hazardous, let's take a look now at the current state of medical gameplay, what's being adjusted for Alpha 317, and what's on the horizon after that. So the response to healing um, was quite heartening. There was some really good community engagement around the feature. Um, I remember at one stage on Reddit, I think it was even before the feature was released, someone had posted a survival guide and it was just really cool to see how excited people were about the feature. 
It's a really expansive system, so there's lots of different parts, and it was a lot to sort of get everything working. It was great to see that people were happy and excited about various aspects of the healing. The medical bed UI in particular, um, which is the main thing I worked on, has a lot of depth to it in terms of adding to the feeling that it's a real hospital and a real place and you can do sort of, you're really healing yourself. I really enjoy the fact that there is some consequence to death now, that there's a sense of continuity. I don't just die, I magically respawn somewhere. Um, you know, my corpse is something I now have to go and find if I put something important on it. What we worked on is a T0 implementation, so it's bare bones, there's so much more to do. <laughs> there are a few things we've fixed since then that should be coming out in 3.17. I've had feedback saying that bleed is too harsh, and absolutely, we've addressed that. It was unfortunately an oversight on our part, and we've reduced the severity of bleeding, so you won't start bleeding and then, you know, keel over two seconds later. Instant death, we never want to have someone fall over and die immediately from a single, like, pistol shot to the head, um, or, you know, the foot. Uh, we've think, covered a couple of issues that were causing that, so 317, we should see that removed entirely. We've also had feedback regarding sort of hunger thirst and also the, the status system in general, just not persisting between like play sessions. So yeah, now uh, between logins, uh, most of your stats will persist, your health, your injuries, your hunger and thirst, so we'll see that gameplay back in the PU properly. We've also had some feedback on regarding the crime stats. Uh, this was one that I hadn't encountered, but sort of face palmed when I saw it. If you ram your own corpse uh, with a ship, you get a crime rating for it. And that's that's not obviously great. It's sort of an extra um, kick to your dignity. Uh, but thankfully, the Mission Future team guys have, have drilled into that and fixed it. So 317, that, that, that um, humiliation should be removed, thankfully. For the injuries not being seen enough, we've also added a bit of probability into it. If you jump off uh, a tree, there's every chance you're going to snap every bone in your body or you're going to land like you can. So we've introduced the, you know, a little bit of a random element um, that doesn't scale linearly um, to, 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 to try and achieve that. And it, it's, it's really worked out, I think, quite well. We're seeing injuries more often and it's not always at a, you know, a, a gamified value that you reach. Pay attention to this last part. Beyond 317, there are other things we want to get into. We want to make improvements. Body dragon, for example, we know that's not exactly great right now. Uh, if you want to drag someone into an elevator, it can be a bit hit or miss. We're definitely looking to improve that. Some people just don't care about injuries because they just mash the die button and then respawn in their ship and then, haha, they move on. Uh, that won't be possible moving forward um, once we get some really big changes in. Uh, and again, this is, you know, quite a ways away, uh, but, you know, things like permadeath, um, DNA degradation, being charged to respawn, uh, the idea of uh, your character dying forever and having to uh, spawn next to kin, those are all things we're fairly confident that are going to be coming in at some point in the distant future. Uh, the manner in which they come in, we've got an idea of how they're going to be developed and also how they're going to function. Uh, we have had a lot of other feedback uh, that I haven't covered so far and the reason I've not addressed is because we don't yet have a solid, solid idea of uh, how we're going to address that, and we don't want to make any promises that we're not going to fulfill. In recent dev posts and discussions on Spectrum, we have seen the future of Death of a Spaceman. It's starting to form into a solid game mechanic with tangible consequences and tangible rewards. Injuries, item loss, negative character traits, Fines, fees, insurance, reputation loss, criminal penalties, and time sink costs are all active consequences that are already featured in the PU. And these consequences and the choices we make around them continue to evolve and expand into depth with every new patch to the live game. Gone are the days when death simply meant an arbitrary application of negative effects and penalties. The how, the where, the when, and the why of our death changes and affects so many different variables within this great mechanic. 
And already, we see how death of a spaceman is punishing and consequential within Star Citizen. But now, let's flip that coin. What about the reward? What can we gain from death of a spaceman? Is it all just doom and gloom for the death of our characters within the verse? Or is there something more to this mechanic? Okay, all right. Let's stand up real quick. Let's get the blood flowing, okay? All right. Uh, let's stretch to the left a little bit. Okay, stretch to the right. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. Let's, uh, you know what, forget stretching up. I don't want to hit the ceiling fan. Death of a Spaceman is a vital mechanic within Star Citizen. It's a core pillar that shapes this entire project. It impacts the shape of the ships, and it impacts the depths of the cities. And most importantly, it affects the actions and choices of players within the Star Citizen universe. Now, so far, this video may seem a bit doomy and gloomy with our focus around death and the surrounding negatives about that. Death is not a lighthearted topic, and it's certainly not a topic that should just be glossed over lightly. To wrap up this discussion, I want to end us on a positive note. I want to consider the positives of the death of a spaceman and what that could look like in the distant future of Star Citizen. Death of a Spaceman rewards players, not in sums of capital or reductions of inconvenience, but in more subtle and nuanced ways. For too long, gamers have grown accustomed to just hitting a button, respawning right back into the action, and really only ever ending their character's existence when they shut the desktop down for the night. This is not going to be the case in Star Citizen. In the persistent universe, your character persists. Your actions dictate your future paths. Your choices facilitate your victory or loss. And your death will tell a story. A story that you and others can learn from. A story that may shape the verse and leave a smoking crater in the side of a moon. An explanation of why things will never go back to the way they once were. And a chance for the future to be brighter and more impactful than the past. Death of a Spaceman will make you a better gamer. Death of a Spaceman will drive a dynamic story that will only be told once. And if you manage to hop on board of this crazy train, if only for a moment, your life and death within the persistent universe can shape the stars forever. Chris Roberts and us, the backers, have given one another a golden opportunity to revolutionize the video game industry at large, and even real life society with Star Citizen and Death of a Spaceman. Star Citizen strives to be an MMO unlike any before it. And in the league of great MMOs, we must consider the past greats, like World of Warcraft, who had, at one point, tens of millions of players, created one of the biggest and most powerful gaming companies in the entire industry. Now, obviously, times are changing. Judgment withheld. And helped shape the MMO genre and gaming at large for the entire world. People lived for World of Warcraft. People got married over World of Warcraft. People got divorced over World of Warcraft. And people died over World of Warcraft. Real life death. I speculate that these same circumstances and potentially even greater will take place in Star Citizen. Star Citizen has the chance to shape the real world and affect the way all humans think about the world we live in. 
What people play and experience in Star Citizen will have deep and meaningful experiences bestowed upon them for the rest of their lives. And the death of a spaceman could possibly inspire the life of a human. Maybe even to take humanity to the stars and beyond. Or just to my ceiling fan, you know. You never know. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining me on this journey today. I hope this has educated you and helped shape your opinion and ideas about Star Citizen. I probably won't ever do another video like this. Considering the absurd amount of work I've put into producing this content... But if you like this content, if you really enjoyed this video today, hey, be sure to let me know. Like, comment, subscribe, the usual tropey stuff, you know, I, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> I try not to be that guy. But I do want to thank you guys so much for today for watching this video. I'm Soul Sentinel, and for now I'm signing out. Stay safe and fly safe. Maybe one day, I'll see you in the verse. This is Soul Sentinel, signing out. <laughs>